WBAI, Pacific Arena. Your weapon of mass destruction in New York. And uh, big shout out to uh, Box Naimis in, uh, in Durban. Uh, the Guardian USA team, who has now brought me home, I'll be writing with them, launched the new Guardian USA. It's a newspaper. You might get used to it. It's really good. Uh, we have a new newspaper. Uh, it's not as best for or the Washington Project. Friends of the Congo, thank you, our special honor guest tonight. Resistance is resistance from the front lines of the occupation. And my friends at Greenpeace, who are comp tonight in return for their summary. I'm not making that up. But guys, you better return before someone realizes it's missing. And shout out to Danny Schechter, the news dissector, Shakur al Jumani, and this happens, the big fix. Hey, I, I don't know what film star now. I'm in the big fix about the deep water horizon. Um, then we're on a water defense, Chris Lee, a geek girl burlesque. And stand for freedom and um, stop fracking now. If we have our position around here. And I'm looking for my other travel about. So the team is here. Christy Spiker is here from our, the Palace Pistas. And Georgie Zychek, which means rabbit. Yuri, that's not his real name, but you're not allowed to know it. Our Russian guru. Thank you, Ray Romano, our creative director. Not his original name either. Anthony Pinieri, he's going to have to get a, a fake name. He's our new editor prodigy. And Ronald Roberts, our fish biologist. <laughs> so he's investigating in uh, the Gulf Forest under that name, but his real name is Zach Roberts, the Gonzo of the Photo Journalist. Where's Zach? Okay, great. And Ricky <laughs> Ricardo are completely Nuts cameraman is uh, here returned. He's somewhere between Alabama and Yemen, back from Iraq and Afghanistan with the Yemeni state help. And also this bad penny, money bad penny. And by the way, that is your because there really is a bad penny. And there really is a gold finger, except I won't talk about him. But he is, uh, well, I, I oh, shoot. There's no sugar bubbles in here. <laughs> Did you see Did you see these white cans of coke around them? Um, yeah. They're white cans and three of them photos are just so cute. Oh, we're gonna talk about that. <laughs> guest of honor, especially if I guess of honor, um, couldn't be here tonight. Regrets Mr. Paul Singer, or otherwise known as Paul the Vulture Singer. It's worth about four billion. Number one donor to the Republican Party, not the Cokes, actually. The, uh, when the Cokes want to scare their children, which is Paul. And he is also, even if Romney is still here, he is the number one supporter and number one advisor on the economy. I invited him tonight as our special guest is that last week, after I did one of the BBC ran a story on the book Vulture's Picture, one of the investigations I just called the Congo in Bosnia, hunting down his buddy Goldfinger's activities. Paul Singer called my bosses at BBC Television Centre in London and said, We have a file. So I invited him here tonight to share the file with us. <laughs> I'm curious, aren't you? But he's not here. So I'm going to share my file on him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll just wait, yeah, two demands of these. One, get me off the air. Two, why don't we change the name of from Vulture's Picnic to Job Creators well, I don't know, maybe about that tonight. We can vote on that. And by the way, if anyone cannot hear me, can you all hear me in the back? If it's too loud, just off let me know. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. And they hear you. The one percent. Yeah. Well, we're going to try it. 
So why are you out there? Why are these kids out there in tarps and tents? I mean, one radio host called it the flea party. They don't know what they want. They didn't have seven bags. They didn't have a PR firm that they hired at the tea party to get them seven bags. So why do we occupy? Occupy Wall Street. It's not about Wall Street. Wall Street, you look at our Google Maps. It's a place on Google Maps. street address is a piece of tarmac. No cares. It's about the 1%. The movers and shakers and moving shakers. And that's what Vulture's Picnic is about an investigation of this 1%. Right? Why do we occupy? We occupy for Stanley and Manning. Now, Stanley, Stanley Ann is a, I hate giving this placement, uh, <laughs> I don't. It's water. Um, Stanley and Natalie is an Osage Indian to live in a trailer out in Oklahoma. And she was watching these trucks come and take uh, oil from those, you know, those dipping horses you see, the stripper wells, and they hired a company to come and take oil off the Osage Indian Reservation. She makes about $30 a week from that. It's important to her. It was important to her. And uh, the truck came in and took, uh, you know, 70 gallons of oil and went down 60, went to your neighbor's place. 104 gallons of oil and down to two. And so on. There was a skin. They took it and didn't record it. They were taking in oil off the Indian reservation and not marking it. Okay, it's that. How do I know this? Well, we are filming. I was working with the FBI actually. Because before I was an investigator reporter, I had a real job. I was an investigator. I was a gunshot. Did big things. They're following. Follow the trucks back. It adds up, you know, a few barrels here, a few barrels there. I figure about $160 million worth of skin. Trucks go back to Loading Dock in Oklahoma. And there's a guy you know, standing there like this, and he's saying, More overage. I want to see more overage. Now, overage is that difference between what they say they got and what they took. And the drivers knew their jobs were on the line. But the man on the dock wanted more overage. Oh, his name is Charles Cook. <laughs> Recorded. Now, why? That's my question. Why? Why? I mean, the guy, I mean, he got, he earned his money the old fashioned way. His, his dad had a billion dollars. His dad was the head of John Birch's science, I guess you say. Um, the old fashioned story. But, so, why does this born with a billion kid want more? Why do you take the 30 bucks a week from Stanley and Matt? What's that? Mean? Okay. Well, we had one of his executives wired. And he talked about Coke's answer. Because he had, well, um, talk. Why? Why do you want this light in the ladies' 30 bucks? And Coke said, I want what's coming to me. And that's all of it. And that's why we occupy. <laughs> and we occupy with Jason Anderson. He was one of the last year. Jason Anderson was vaporized. He was one of the 11 workers on the Deepwater Horizon. Instantly vaporized when the Deepwater Horizon exploded. And the American newspapers, they were stunned. BP, isn't that the green oil company? I mean, they painted their gas stations green, so we know they're a green oil company. We knew that, right? Um, but I have five, I have big files.
be a witness and have the information on the deep water horizon blowing up in the Gulf. Well, once I set up a secure line, the answer was that this was not the first explosions in the Gulf. He had witnessed, he was an eyewitness to the other blowout two years earlier. What? There's another blowout? Yeah, I can read that in the uh, New York Pravda. <laughs> Washington's best job. <laughs> BP. It was a BP transocean rig, same as the Gulf. And it blew out for the same reason cheap crap cement that they used. Halliburton mixture nitrogen that won't hold under those underwater pressures. But it does save at least a million bucks a day. Quick set. Quick cheap doesn't work, but they they now wait a minute. That's serious. Because if that's true, if <coughs> people knew and they covered it up, and you know they went November 2009, they BP executives and the other oil company executives who were their partners in the cast see, so they knew all about it. Uh, went before Congress and swore November 2009, <laughs> six months before the deep, four, five months before the deep water horizon explosion, that there was no problem with this method of drilling ever. They covered it up. In other words, deep water horizon was not an accident. It was a homicide. Private jet, 
pick up a zero efficient because the Islamic Republic of BP, so they can't do anything there. So they take it to London for lap dancing for the weekend. That's how you cover it up. Zipper's down, mouth closed. Okay? Mouth's full. Um, and bribery? You'll meet the bag man talking about taking two bags to, uh, to Azerbaijan and uh, $30 million of ground to lease the other people to that trip. So what happened? But that was what he said, because all I showed him was meant to be, there was no 30 million left in there. So I decided to get the info, so I go to a CIA agent, an ex-CIA agent, who had just gotten a 90 million dollar check from British Petroleum, and I knew he was in a real bad mood about BP. See, he used his info as head of oil resources, intelligence, and health secret station to become a demi-billionaire by owning a chunk of the Caspian Sea with British Petroleum. And the nine million was about 180, I figured by my count, it was about 180 million dollars short of what they owed him. So I knew I had a billionaire in bed. Love that. So um, we meet in a safe house. Um, and I said, so what happened? How did they cover this stuff up? He says, Lord Brown bribes, BP bribes. And I said, okay, that's a felony crime. I can't report that on British television because there is no freedom of speech. You know that I don't think people here realize that in the mother country, there is no First Amendment freedom of the press or freedom of speech. In fact, we've been campaigning for it, but I have said that they can borrow ours because we don't use it. So, <laughs> so, so I said, so wait, that's serious. How about how much did they say? Well, one drop was about $84 million. I said, I said BP plus uh, seven oil companies all together. I said, I can't report that because like, you're claiming a felony crime. I said, you have to prove it. He said, well, they sent me an invoice. I shared the invoice. Okay. So that's what And we occupied for Etoll. Okay. He has these cute little polar bears and these white cans of Coca-Cola. And, and if you get a Coca-Cola can, you take off them, you go to their website, give them a dollar, they'll put in a dollar too. So far, it's like a $4 million campaign. They raised $34,000, but for what? For a sanctuary for these little polar bears. Now, at, yeah, it's, maybe it's my dad to his investigative report. I'm thinking, why do polar bears need a sanctuary? <laughs> what are they doing in the Coca Cola Zoo? Why are they going there? What's this about? And then I get a message, I kid you not, from the chief of intelligence of the Free Republic of the Arctic. <coughs> saying, get out to Kotkovic right now. You have to be up here right now. They're tagging polar bears. And say, so I look up the Google map. <laughs> Kotkovic is a little island on the north slope of Alaska above the Arctic Circle. And so now I'm waiting for my staff to send the next request from, you know, one of Santa's elves. Uh, but then I got another message from the chief of the Republic of the Arctic saying, Etoff needed me up there right now. And that, I can't ignore, Eton is the legendary Eskimo leader and whale hunter. So I had to have any book, I said, get me something that lands on skis on the ice, let's go. And so I went up. Uh, Eton, if you saw the films, that was a guy um, using um, unchurch like language, whatever. Anyway, he was concerned that there might be oil drilling about to occur on the North Slope. Okay. And um, I, said, ah, I said, just have some coke. Come on. And he suggested, and BP was going to drill, so he wanted me as, a, as from the British Broadcasting Corporation official agency to explain to my queen where a uh, suggested better place to stick her oil was. And I said, it's anatomically impossible. <laughs> 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, and, and of course, I'd be polite. I, he took me over to uh, a whale. We got sat inside a whale and we had some fermented whale meat and congealed blood. And you'll see me there uh, trying to get that. If you ever have a chance, by the way, to eat, um, you know, fermented whale meat and congealed blood, don't. <laughs> Anyway, he said they're tagging the polar bears. The only reason, and I, and I checked with the Department of Interior, they're tagging just for census. They said they're an endangered species, so they keep track of them with these little taxes. No, they're tagging them to move them. They're tagging them to move them. Because underneath the bears, which until recently you couldn't get to because it's ice sheet. Right? And, but now, there is a new oil company practice center called Global Warming. The cat smell, the oil is exposed, and the polar bears have got to be moved. And so, he said, there's a problem here. So he took me out to the whale for a reason. Eating whale, taking whales, is not like a cultural experience for them. It's a lunch experience, okay? He said, if we don't have a whale, we don't exist. Except to clean porta potties on oil derricks. Because okay. whales don't like swimming in oil any more than you do. All right? But my, I have to admit, my, um, my network couldn't run that. It's, it's kind of like conspiratorial, you know? Where is the proof? They're tagging polar bears. I mean, so they're taking out some You know, what's this all about? So they got a little zoo. Uh, so I left, and then we couldn't report that part of the story. Uh, and then uh, in August this year, uh, because then you know, even George Bush could not drill in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge up there. But in August, President Obama authorized Shell Oil to begin drilling at Kaktuvik. And that's why we occupy. Okay. And we occupy for Chief Kriyoyo and his sons. See, I, 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 you know, I, got to tell you, I actually didn't really have to investigate. I told BBC and Guardian and Chad Ford television, we didn't need to investigate BP because PBS Frontline had already investigated it. And what they found, if you watch their big investigation called The Spill, is that the problem was that BP had a lack of a safety culture. Like, you know, culture issue, you know, like not wearing gloves to the opera. Okay, well, okay, that's cool. And um, they said for years, BP had ignore safety problems in oil drilling. Now I said, well, so yes, ignore safety problems in oil drilling, but okay. Um, and they said, so BP had no culture of safety, unlike Chevron, which has a culture of safety right on front line. They had the Chevron president get up and say, no, we, nothing like this would happen. So when I was asked to, to cover five continents for my British network, I said, that, that's a lot of traveling and this one problem's been solved. I mean, you know, BP bad, Chevron good. And they said, well, we want you to check out Chevron. And I said, why? So they, they've got a good safety culture. And they said, first check out the PBS website. I said, I don't see anything. They said, Check out the PBS website from a few months ago before the, that film was made in the Wayback Machine, and you will see the logo of PBS's official national sponsor, Chevron Corporation. <laughs> now, no connection. No connection. We don't make connections. We're Americans. Okay, so I have to go down on this. So get down, you're going to have to check out Chevron safety culture in the Amazon. They've been accused, Chevron's Texaco unit, of crapping oil all over the Amazon rainforest and causing people to get sick and kids to die. And I said, you know, PBS didn't do it. There's the, no, no one touched the story. You know, except the Wall Street Journal, which said it was all fraud. The New York Times, which, which reported the story, which said the Wall Street Journal said it was all fraud. That's investigative reporting that we get. Investigative repeating, I call it. 
Um, unfortunately, at the British Network, you actually have to go there. So I said, how do I get into the rainforest, man? I mean, these, you know, it's like, it's, you know. Uh, in fact, if you've ever been there, uh, it, well, it's a rainforest if you're in the Sierra Club. When you get there, it's a jungle. Okay. So I'm going to jump into that. I said, they'll say, we'll have a boat waiting for you, all set up. It's all arranged. So I take it on the plains and go over the Andes and into the rainforest, and a jeep and company, and their tractors are open, pouring down, and Ricardo and I, are uh, there at the end of the room and they end this guy. So I'm waiting for, um, you know, I'm waiting for um, Humphrey Bogart in the African <laughs> Yeah. And the guy in the Jeep said, Subarco, your boat. <laughs> and I'm looking at, I kid you not, you'll see it in the little film. It's a dugout log with a hand carved paddle. And there's this raging tributary of the Amazon. I don't see my hat go out to, you know, floating down from Brazilian. And, and by the way, oh, 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 oh,